At the beginning of the year, God gave Calvary Life the word beyond. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is moving and going beyond. Ministries are growing. Needs are being met. Lives are being changed. Evidence is seen. Man, it is a privilege just to close out this series on going beyond. Um, it's been powerful. Last week, Pastor Steve really talked about going beyond ourselves and and thinking of the world and not being so self-focused. Because a lot of times we can be self-focused. And when Pastor Gwenmar talked about, he was praying uh, the end of last year about a word and God had gave him the word um, beyond. And so let's get into this word because I do not want to compete with baptism in a barbecue. Amen. So this is going to be a, a great, a great word, but a very succinct word. Um, let's turn to Ephesians 3, 20, 21. And I want us to read it together as we've been doing every week. All right. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Isn't that powerful? The power that works in us, not our power, but the power that works in us. And I, I know I, I haven't felt very powerful the past few weeks. It's been it's been such a, a difficult time for our country and a difficult time for the church, the American church, hasn't it? You know, and um, it's, it's been a rough couple of weeks because of the lack of accountability, unaddressed sexual allegations in, in prominent churches in America. And the time is now that God wants to do something. He's purging us. He's getting us ready. And how many of you saw that presidential debate? I'm still just like, what just happened? What just happened and how did we get here? But you see the lack of accountability even in our country and church and state. And so that's what really drew me to this topic today. And I, I entitled this message, Leading Beyond. Leading Beyond. That means going beyond yourself. Amen. And the time is now because God is purging his bride, the church. So don't think it's strange that things are coming up that we're hearing about um, misdeeds and abuse and neglect. And we have presidents that are not taking accountability. I don't care whether you're Democrat, Republican or independent. You see the lack of accountability and leading beyond yourself means that he is searching for true leaders, true leaders that will rise above themselves. Number one, they will activate the power that Paul said is in us in the scripture we just read. They will lead with integrity and they will lead in humility. See, a lot of leaders that we see fall from grace, they start off correctly, most of them, but then they get puffed up and it's a lack of accountability and, and, and it can happen to all of us if we're not careful. So I want to give us some tools so we can be healthy. Amen. So how to lead beyond ourselves, the definition of leadership, the act of leading a group of people or an organization to have influence, to take the initiative of something. Are you a leader in your household, job, family, church or business? Do you lead by title or do you lead by example? And I got to confess to you guys, I, I, I've been taking this Pilates class early Friday morning. And there's one leader of this class, and that's the Pilates instructor. And so I, I came to the class the first week, and I brought this thick mat because my knees hurt. And, 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 and here I am asking the teacher if this mat was appropriate. And then I hear these other leaders behind, that's not the right one. 
that, that mat is for sleeping. And I'm like, I'm talking to the leader. I'm talking to the teacher. I, I, I don't need interference. Amen. And so a lot of times we think leadership is just by title. But leadership is where you see a need. Amen. And a lot of times we're looking for a title, but we don't recognize when you lead right where you are, if you take the initiative and that you will walk into the destiny that God has called for you. A lot of questions that we get as pastors, what's my calling? What's my purpose? Well, we know the general purpose. Our purpose is to reach the lost, to glorify God. And there may be specific callings that God has. He may call some to, to, to lead specifically in a business, a call to pastor, call to teach. But the main thing is we have to, to lead where we are. We have to serve where we are. And so if you look at the slide that we just read of of going beyond, Paul was powerfully favored, supernaturally gifted, and abundantly successful. Paul was powerfully favored, supernaturally gifted, and powerfully successful. Life did not always look successful. And a lot of times as leaders, we have to redefine our definition of success. We know that Paul was radical. (laughs) He was, he was, he served the people. He was shipwrecked. He was in jail. He wrote two thirds of the Bible and a lot of them, they were, they were from jail. Paul wrote Romans 1 and 2, uh, Romans, uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. But he was radical, and his parents planned his life out. By four, he was reading the Torah. He was being taught by the best teacher of that time, and his goal was to be the high priest. His life was filled with many trials. But then how many know that, how many of you know that life hits you? Life hits you. And a lot of times the way we start, we don't finish. And some of those interruptions, we say, oh, the devil. But many of those interruptions are God putting us on the right course. How many of you prayed, saved up money and, and, and asked God for something and it did not come to pass? Let's get real for a second. How many of you have done that? And so the first step that we're going to learn from Paul is that we must activate the power that God has in us, not our power. My mother used to say, stop showing off, stop showing off. You know, when I would have company come over to the house, I would take out all my stuff. I would do my dance. I learned in dance in school. I would tell people everything I knew. And that's what we do a lot of times as individuals. We have natural talents. We have natural giftings. But in the body of Christ, if you are to lead well, what separates true leaders from false leaders are those that rely on the gifting of God. Amen. The Holy Spirit filled Paul with his conversion when he was off to this path. And, and he empowered him to share the good news. And he walked the earth proclaiming that Jesus was Lord. Let's read Ephesians 3, 14 and 21. And this is really going to bring this point home. It says, for this reason, I bowed down my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with his might through his Holy Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passeth all knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. 
And one trap I want to give you that I see this constantly with leaders, I'm talking about leaders who have great potential, who have a lot of knowledge, who have a lot of ability, is that they have, I call the significance trap. They're looking for their significance in you and me, and they need that attaboy or that girl. But Paul, he knew his accolades, but he recognized that power of God that was in him. The significance trap will get you in trouble all the time. I need to be significant. I need to be seen. I need to be the loudest one. I need to speak so you will believe that I have the ability. And Paul knew who he was, but he counted it all dung. He counted it all nothing without the power that resided in him. So let's not get caught up in the significance trap. It's that let another person honor you. Let another man praise you and not your own lips. Let another man praise you. I mean, God takes us leaders around so many, so many uh, times, and he's like, I hope they pass it this time. But then we rise up in pride and say, look at me. Don't you know how long I've been doing this? Don't you know I'm gifted? I'm the best singer. I, I, you know, my accolades, they pull out their resume, and we're just having lunch. I'm just trying to enjoy my bagel and find out what you're doing this summer. I, I just, I just want to... I want to find a friend. But you don't know when you humble yourself, God will exalt you. The significance trap, it will get you every time. How do I find my significance in God? How do we activate the power within us? First of all, we ask God for strength. I have a favorite chair in my prayer room, and I can't wait to get there every morning. I wake up, I brush my teeth, I wash my face, I press the coffee button, and I go to my favorite chair because that's where I get revelation. That's where I get significance. That's where I get the download for the day. That's where I repent from saying too much or doing too much the day before. That's where I get my peace. That's where I get the glow for the day. And so if I'm not recognized, if I'm not seen, if I'm not picked, if I'm not noticed, it doesn't matter. Because I was made significant in my chair. The Holy Spirit met me in my chair. Amen. And so what happens is you don't need a spotlight. God will promote you where you need to be. Amen. The significance trap, that is one thing. Being rooted. Stop showing off. My mother used to say, I keep hearing. When I was writing this, I kept saying, kept hearing that. Stop showing off. We show off in the body of Christ. Because we don't know our significance in God. That should separate us from carnal leaders. True leaders know their significance in God. Number two, we looked at Paul and we understood how he relied on the power of God. Number two, lead with integrity. We're going to look at Deborah. I want to preach on this later on. I'm not going to get into her, but I want to extract the integrity that she had. She had a good witness. We have great leaders with good, good track records, great abilities, but a poor witness. We got to get back to having leaders who are unified. That word integrity means one. It means wholeness. It means undivided. Wouldn't it be nice to be undivided, to be the same one place as you are another place, to let your yay be yay and your nay be nay? Anything else the Bible says comes from the evil one. We want to be different. We want to be clear. We want to be refreshing. How is God preparing the bride? He is making us people of integrity so we don't stink when the harvest comes. So we don't stink. We'll be refreshing because our yay was yay and our nay was nay. The only female judge in history, Deborah, God wasn't looking at gender. He's looking at the heart who is sold out for God. He is looking for someone that does not add to what they say. You know those prophet, prophets or prophecies, those prophelies. Just say what God says. Amen. 
<laughs> she served in an ex as an ancient Israel in a moral way. She refused to show partiality. She was a prophet. She was a judge. She, she, she judged under a palm tree. She lived for 60 years. And like Moses and David, she was a national leader and a military commander. So let's um, look at Judges 4, 4 through 5. It says, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at the time she held court under a palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and the hill country of Ephraimite. Ephraim, she was an Ephraimite, they, they assumed. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. They came to her in ancient Israel to have their disputes decided. That's awesome. And... I just love how she was honest. She had to speak the truth in love, and it had, could not be easy. For women who are in leadership, it is not easy oftentimes because people question you. People look at you as emotional when you are making a decision. They take the stereotype of you not being reasonable. And I can imagine this woman in that time leading. I'm all for men leading the home, but I do believe that women have a, a, a special place in the end time harvest because it's going to require all of us to rise up and, and follow our calling and to lead well, lead well. Deborah's willingness to step into her leadership role despite societal expectations. She was a wife. She was a mother, but... She did what God wanted to do. He aligned, she aligned her purposes with God's purposes. Amen. He equips us with strength to fulfill the call. How else does she lead with integrity? She courageously rose to the challenge. Deborah displayed immense courage by leading the Israelites into battle. Um, Judges 4, 6 through 7 says, She sent for Barak, son of Abinom, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to them, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take, your ten, take you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun and lead them up to Mount Tabar. I will lead Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and troops to the Kishon River and give them into your hands. What is going on? She's not just judging under a tree. Now she's leading. She's commanding. And I know I would have been afraid. You know, you hear about women, you know, Harriet Tubman leading. She had so many roles. Not only did she lead the Underground Railroad, but she helped. She was a spy in the war. It's amazing. And so it's, it's like you may have a plan for your life like Paul did, but would you be willing to course correct and say, God, let your will be done. A lot of times we compare ourselves to other people. We want the anointing. We want the giftings. We want what someone else has. But we will walk into our own power. We will find our own significance when we say, yes, Lord, what do you have for me? It goes back to significance. It goes back to understanding that God is no respecter of persons. Male, female, able, disabled, black, white, red, green. It doesn't matter. He looks at the heart. We judge the outside, but God looks at the heart. So leadership is a leveling field if you will say yes to God. And lastly, she acknowledged God's role in the victory. You don't have to turn to it, but when they won that battle, she just gave the glory to God. She was also, she, she's getting on my nerves now. She was a, actually a psalmist. I mean, what can this woman do? I mean, it's amazing. And, and I just find that, I'll read it, Judges 5.3. Hear this, hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers, I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will praise the Lord, the God of Israel, and so on. And so a lot of times we start off giving the praises to God, but a lot of times when we start getting good feedback from others, we begin to think it's ourselves. We begin to think, we, we, we start, you know, Paul says you start the right way, but then you end up in the flesh, you know. So we, there's always that 
This is why we have to spend time with God because we're human and we're not perfect and we all have brokenness. So it doesn't mean that we have to be perfect in this, but it means that we have to have a place to say, give us this day my daily bread and forgive me for my trespasses as I forgive those who trespass against me. Lord, put me in alignment because I'm offended. I'm hurt. I feel betrayed. And a lot of times we lead out of that betrayal. We lead because no one found us significant before. So now I get a little taste of leadership and I'm going to lord it over you. Woe to the leader that does that. Because Jesus didn't do that. And we're going to look at that too. Draw inspiration from her. Oh, I love it because she embraced courage and Deborah embraced leadership with unwavering faith in God's guidance. She heard from the Lord. And may her story encourage you. And lastly, we're going to look at Paul again. We want to lead with humility. Oh, my goodness. If anyone could be proud, it could have been him. Don't let me write two-thirds of the New Testament. I will walk around. I, my head would be up here. Which book, do you, which book did I write? Could, oh, you want to talk about the book I wrote. Which one? First or second? I don't know. I can't remember. The Lord was just speaking. He just downloads things to me. So God knew I could not do that. Amen. God knows I can't sing because I still would be singing if I was Candace. I'll be humming. I'll be humming amen. So God knows who he can bless what with. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you have giftings and you say, oh, man, why can I get to that next level? Why can I? I got all the giftings. I did all the right things. How can I get to that? Why am I not getting to that next level? Could it be a lack of humility? Could it be? I don't know. I'm asking. Could it be a lack of humility? I ask myself that question often. I, I, am I missing something? Am I relying too much on my, my degrees or am I, am I, am I, um, I'm a quick mover. I, you know, I, I'm a planner. I, I don't like to talk about dreams and okay, what are we doing? Right? So am I moving before God? Like, what are we going to eat? Where are we going to go? I can't, I can't have this conversation anymore. What are we what are we doing? I lack patience, and I know that. And that's why the Holy Spirit levels us and purges us. But we got to lead with humility, not lead out of our brokenness, not lead out of, I got the power now. Philippians 2, 1 through 4, Paul gives us the principle. You don't have to look at it. Um, of what he wants us to apply in his daily lives. In Philippians 2, 5, 1, he gives us a picture of how Jesus applied this uh, life of humility. And um, I'm trying to think, let's, let's go to Philippians 2. Therefore, if there is any consolation, some translations say encouragement in Christ, if any comfort or love, if any fellowship of the Holy Spirit, if any affection or mercy... Fulfill my joy be, being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. I'm like, does this even happen in church? Does this even happen in politics? Like, where's the leadership? Like, a lot of things will be solved <laughs> if we did this. And let's stop right here. The mind of Christ. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. That's hard. You know how it is when someone is speaking to you and they're saying, wow, you have a great gift, Rashad. Wow, you, you have a gift, great gift, Vivian. And they want you to do something, but then there's an undercurrent of something else. You know, that friend that invites you to lunch and you're like, oh, we're catching up. And then they try to sell you Melaleuca. I'm like, what, what is going on? What is happening? What, what, what other selfish ambitions that we have? And God is looking for leaders who would not lead out of selfish ambition. Value others above self. Oh my goodness. What does that mean? It's more blessed to give than receive. So if you value others more than yourself, you're not going to lose. You're going to receive. 
Oh my gosh, we haven't gotten that. I, I, I just want to do a study on that next year. It's better to give than receive. It's better to give than receive. It's better to give than receive. There's a, there's a supernatural uh, power that's unlocked, a grace where Jesus is like, yep, they're being like me. They're being like me. We're talking about being powerfully favored. That's good. That's good. Value others above yourselves. Three, express concern for others' interests. You ever have a friend or a leader that just doesn't ask you about how you're doing? They're giving you a directive. They're, they're talking about their issues. You have a friend you just, you're waiting to ask, you're, you're saying like, well, what about me? You know, I heard about all the woes in your life, but I'm going through stuff too, Right? We want to be, we don't want to be like that. Let's continue in verse five. We're finishing up. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted himself and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and of, and of those of earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to the Father. There was a humble mindset. That's how we lead with humility. And and, in closing, I want to say this humble mindset, number one, that we see in these scriptures, 5 through 10, it says that Jesus was willing to sacrifice. We don't understand the position that he had in heaven. He had angels worshiping him. He was good. (laughs) He chose to give up his life. He chose to come to earth, not to be king, not to be present, but a carpenter. That's powerful when you understand what his position, he is God. That's just powerful. So he was willing to sacrifice. We're talking about leadership. A lot of times people think leadership is glamorous. But leadership has to have a willingness mindset, a humble mindset to sacrifice your money, your time, and your energy. Number two, the humblest mindset was willing to serve. He did not come to earth to serve, but he came to serve people. Washing feet, healing people, teaching people, just playing with the kids, loving the kids, receiving, forgiving, touching people. He was a leader. Do I look like I, I, I want to be served? Do I want to be served? Or do I want to serve? Are certain tasks beneath you? Do we do whatever it takes? Or do we have partiality with the things that we decide to do. Jesus was willing to submit. He was willing to suffer. But a lot of times, are we that type of person that that needs to be in control of every situation? I hate flying. We got to fly this summer. But I hate flying because I'm like, these poor airline attendants, these plane attendants, just put your seatbelt on. Put your iPad away. You could take it out after we... Why are they giving her a hard time? But do we need to be in control in every situation? Are we willing to be inconvenienced or even suffer for the gospel? What type of leader are you? Now is the time God is revealing himself. God is exposing But it's very exciting time because he's looking for people 
who are pure in heart, who want to lead beyond themselves. This is a time for the unlikely people to come out of obscurity and be used like never before. Now is the time. So Paul and Jesus Christ, they were willing to sacrifice, willing to serve, willing to submit, and willing to suffer. That is humility. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is in us, to him be the glory in the church to be by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and never. Amen. Humility leads to blessing. If he exalted Christ, he would do the same for you. When we humble ourselves, God will lift you up in due season. And so that one, I want you to think about this. All your ideas of leadership challenge them. Go back and listen to this message and, 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 and read, read the life of Paul. It's a good litmus test to see this man was powerful. He could bring out and brag the most, but he didn't. And I know that God wants to use us. We're an unlikely church but God is going to do some amazing things. Now is our time. Now is your time to rise up and say, God, here I am. I don't have a title. I don't have a position, but I want to lead where I am. I want to lead my family. Some of you guys need to lead your family, (laughs) lead your household. Maybe your extended family needs a touch. Maybe your job needs a touch and when you do that you can see how your life becomes integrated I looked at my husband and before he became a pastor he was just leading on his job promotion after promotion with no degrees I'm like what he got to get his degree to catch up because he was just serving and he was leading and he was picking up what needed to be done and I admire that about him because he just, he didn't wait to have a position. He just saw the need and he did it. That's taking initiative. Stand with me. I want you to think about your ideas of leadership. And I want you to ask God, what are you calling me to do? And how can I, how can I fulfill that calling? and lead well and lead beyond myself.